Hey guys, before we get into the episode, I have just a few podcast-related things to discuss. First, I want to shout out our newest Patreon fan club member, Mackenzie Brunson. Mackenzie is now a premium listener and will enjoy tons of perks, and she's just in time to get our brand new episode of Disturbing Calls, dropping Monday, September 14th which is only available to Patreon fan club members at the $5 level or higher. Make sure to stay tuned to the very end of this episode for a sneak peek at episode 3 of Disturbing Calls. Also, the fan club now has exclusive members-only t-shirts and hoodies for certain levels, so make sure to check that out as well. If you're curious what else is included for fan club members or you want your own shout-out, Visit disturbedpodcast.com slash fan club and join for as little as $3 a month to start receiving your benefits today. And lastly, Podcast Magazine is putting together a list of the top horror podcasts as voted by the fans. So if you have a second, help us out and head over to podcastmagazine.com slash horror and vote for Disturbed. You can list three of your favorite horror-related podcasts. Again, that's podcastmagazine.com slash horror. And now, on with the show. This episode contains real narrated experiences. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening and welcome into Disturbed. I'm your host, Chad. This week, I've got three true experiences that are sure to keep you up at night. So come along and join me as we explore the realm of true horror. Our first experience comes from Reddit user Rome London Paris, with narration by Alexandria Tucker. Sometimes, a helpful mechanic might not always be who he seems. It was a long time ago, before cell phones were prevalent, and I was a mom in my early 30s who had just driven our kids to the pediatrician. The Macon, Georgia doctor's office was an hour away from our home, and I was just taking the two youngest of my three, then ages one and three years old, to our scheduled appointment. Because we lived so far away, their office always gave us the last two appointments of the day, and we were grateful. The doctor had just built a new building off of a fresh spur of the highway, so the location was quite isolated in every direction, but a very nice facility compared to his old spot by the hospital there. His new building was also pretty far back on the new lot, and my car, a black Jeep Cherokee we had owned for two years, was one of only four or five cars in the parking lot when we got there. I parked near the front door, removed the kids from their car seats, and for the next hour or so we waited, then saw the doctor, paid, and finally exited back outside. Mine was the only car left in the lot as I loaded the children into their car seats for our trip home. But, as the receptionist locked the front glass doors, my car somehow wouldn't start when I turned the key. There was just an odd clicking noise. Gathering the children once again, I knocked on the door until someone allowed us back in and asked to borrow their phone to call a nearby garage for service. I found one in the phone book, and the man said that he would come, but that it might be a bit. So, I told him my location, left to go back out to the car rolled down all the windows and loaded the children back into their seats once more as we waited. Soon we watched as all the lights were turned out in the building again and everyone left, their cars departing one by one from behind the building somewhere, leaving us now completely alone in the parking lot. As it was still light, I spent a lot of that time trying to tend to the children, digging through our car for snacks and a bottle, making sure that they weren't getting too hot, etc. Although the service station attendant said that it was probably going to be quite a while, I was pleasantly surprised when a truck pulled into the empty parking lot pretty soon after and a man got out of his pickup, smiled and nodded to me and said he was going to raise the hood. 
He was middle-aged and a bit scruffy, but quite frankly, many gas station attendants sometimes look that way, especially at the end of the day, and I was grateful when he began doing something under the hood almost immediately. I sat down again in the driver's seat with the door open, waiting for him to tell me to try the engine. But he seemed to be taking a long time checking the connections, and I longed for him to just grab the jumper cables, yet he never did. Without getting out of the car, I asked him what he thought was wrong, and he said, Oh, it's just a loose wire, not the battery, and continued whatever he was doing. I couldn't see his face at all from where I was sitting, but his hands were slightly visible through that long horizontal slit between the windshield and the raised hood as we waited. More than once, he said that it was merely a loose wire, and if I would just come up here really quick, he would show me which one it was, so it would never happen again. I remember kind of smiling and shaking my head, saying that sadly there was no reason to show me anything as I didn't know anything about cars. I just thanked him and continued to stay in the driver's seat, again just waiting for the inevitable signal to try to start the ignition that was most surely coming at any moment. At one point, I remember thinking that he was definitely flirting as he spoke, but I was trying to above all be polite and kind as he was indeed helping us. We were hot and tired and miserable. And truthfully, I was distracted with the kids. Oddly enough, he was starting to sound a little frustrated with me because I wouldn't come up and look at the engine. I remember thinking that I certainly didn't want to make him mad where he left us there all alone with the sun sinking so quickly. And then the strangest thing happened. Another truck suddenly pulled into that desolate parking lot. And as it did, this nice guy working underneath my hood suddenly slammed it shut, ran to his truck, started it, and drove away very quickly without even saying a word of goodbye. I was both confused and a little anxious when he did this because I didn't know who was now arriving. I even remember feeling a little frightened that he had suddenly left me there alone with the two little ones, defenseless. Why wouldn't he at least stay and speak to whoever was parking next to me now? It certainly seemed the southerly gentleman thing to do. I looked around and was very aware once again that there were no visible cars on the road, no homes or businesses nearby, and the sun was continuing to set quickly. As this new, also unmarked, pickup pulled in next to me, I got out of the car once again, this time more apprehensively. Upon exiting, though, he immediately introduced himself, and his name and voice seemed to match who I'd spoken to on the phone much earlier. He then actually called me by name, apologized for being so late, and finally smiled and stared towards the road, pointing and asking who the man was that had just left so suddenly. Relieved and unfazed, I just smiled back in surprise and told him, well, I don't know, I thought all this time he was you. And we both laughed slightly, and then he grabbed jumper cables, walked to the front of my car, raised the hood, and started to work. I immediately sat back in the driver's seat once more, suddenly grateful that, with luck, that air conditioner would be blowing full blast shortly, and once again checking the children. While listening for the familiar words, try it, I had my back completely turned towards the children when he surprised me by suddenly coming to the driver's side door. In the strangest voice, he said, Um, ma'am, is this yours? And when I looked into his hands, he was holding a long, thin, dagger-like looking device that was about a foot and a half in length. It appeared to be very old and covered with reddish rust, yet on one end it had tiny circular small finger holes, as if it was a mix of a long thin sword and scissors. I remember being amazed but not frightened and asked where he had found them. Under the hood, he replied. I said just matter-of-factly that I had never seen them before, but how weird was it that those things had somehow been stuck and undiscovered in my car for all those years, and shook my head in surprise. He continued to stand there and stare at them unbelievingly, and he looked oddly pale too, like he couldn't find the words to speak for a bit, just continuing to stare at the unusual object. Honestly, I didn't care one bit about it, all I could think of was getting the car going, letting me pay him, and the cost, and leaving. He didn't say anything, just quickly set them on the curb, started his truck, and then signaled for me to start the jeep. And when it immediately caught, my three-year-old cheered, Grateful, I quickly turned on the air conditioner full blast, rolled up all the windows, aimed the air vents back towards the back seat, and reached for my purse to pay out. I stood up and took a few steps to meet him so I could hear the amount now owed. With both of our vehicles running, he came back around to my driver's side, but instead of handing me the bill, 
irritated me a bit by walking right past me and picking up that weird object once more. Ma'am, he said slowly, I want you to look at these one more time, and held them out for closer inspection. This time, I moved a bit closer and actually really looked. In his hands, the item still appeared incredibly large, possessing an almost bayonet-looking quality except for the strangely small two loops on one end. I had never seen anything like it and told him so. As he held it, he spoke quietly and slowly to me, as if trying desperately to make me understand something that was somehow still going over my head. These weren't hidden somewhere in the engine, ma'am. They hadn't been there very long at all, because they were sitting right on top. They must have just been put there. I shook my head no and half smiled and said, but they're obviously very old and rusty, to which he pointed more closely and replied, yeah, but see how sharp they are? These look like they've just been sharpened. And when I looked down, he was right. The long, skinny, dagger-like shape was unusual, but by far the oddest quality was just how sharp it appeared to be. The edges at the tip where the rust had been removed were gleaming silver. As I paid him, his final words to me were, Ma'am, I don't know what was about to happen here, but I'm really glad I pulled up when I did. He quietly thanked me when taking the payment, told me that I probably needed to call the police when I got home, and then asked me where I wanted the item. I didn't want to touch it, didn't want to take it at all, but I released the back window so he could place it inside. We both then left the lot together, him turning one way, me turning the other towards the small winding highway that would lead home, still an hour away. I did indeed contact the Macon police the moment that we arrived home and I got the children inside safely. But although they listened politely, they declined when I offered to bring the scissor-like thing to them later. The officer I spoke to said they sounded as if they were specialized surgical shears. From my description and measurements on the phone, which I found quite disturbing, as you can imagine. I remember wondering how he would even know that, why he would even say that. I had tried so carefully not to touch any of the surfaces, hoping that they might be able to lift prints or test it for blood if they wanted, but the story seemed to bore him a bit, and he didn't seem interested. His attitude insinuated that, as there was no longer an emergency, it was of no importance now. At the end of his call, as if to wind things up, he did say it sounded as if I was very lucky and that I might want to keep the shears for a few days just in case someone from his office got back with me later. But that was all. I wrapped them carefully in newspaper and placed them in the brick storage unit behind our house. And there they remained for several more years, untouched, until we moved away and I finally, not wanting to bring them across several states, reluctantly threw them in the trash. Around that time, though, if you look through old news reports, women were going missing all over Georgia. Some bodies were eventually found, but others remain missing to this very day. I've often wondered what would have happened if the service station attendant hadn't arrived when he did. If my children would still have a mother. If I would still hide my son and daughter. If I would have missed all these years with them. I guess I'll never know, but I learned something very important about myself that day. I had always felt that I was pretty aware of my surroundings, pretty good at reading people and staying safe. But because I was exhausted and tired and hot and stranded in a different city, my common sense and intelligence simply left me for a bit and wasn't working at that time. And many of my friends and family still think that our car trouble that day and my lack of awareness could easily have cost us our lives. If you enjoy what you're hearing, consider supporting us as a premium listener. Premium listeners enjoy perks like shoutouts, early ad-free episodes, merch store discounts, and bonus episodes. Find out more at disturbedpodcast.com slash fan club. In our next experience... We meet Reddit user Not Sherry Papini with narration by Alexandria Tucker. What exactly do you do when someone you trust turns into a completely different person? 
I was raised in a fairly strict but loving Christian household in a Bible Belt section of the States. My parents weren't at all unreasonable in their rules and were well-intentioned, but I broke a few along the way like most teenagers do. The summer before I started college, I began a relationship with a slightly older guy. I knew him from high school and he was attending the college I would soon be at. Johnny was a catch. He was exceptionally handsome, had been on the football team, and was on a full academic scholarship. Funny, talented, and very personable, there was little to not like about him. We bonded over our teetotalism and love of pranking. The best part, he had his own apartment at my college, which was a four-hour drive from my parents' house. I could easily sneak up there under the guise of visiting one of my other friends or spending the night at a local girlfriend's house. My parents didn't even have to know I had a boyfriend. Now, I had just turned 18 and was enjoying my rebellious streak and newfound freedom, but I still happily lived under my parents' guidance and rules for a large part. They always encouraged me to be a free thinker and ultimately to figure out my own morals and values. And I ended up much like them, because they're honestly that awesome. My mom wisely encouraged me not to just sleep with anyone, and it was something that I actually held to quite strongly. So, while I had no qualms about having sleepovers with my boyfriend, I was intent on not having sex with him. He took it pretty well and seemed to respect my decision. One week, smack dab in the middle of summer, I had three days off in a row at work. A drive up to see Johnny was in order, and I began my travel early in the morning. He was excited to see me, and we had a great day. Nerf gun wars, reading Stephen King, making out. We went out for dinner and returned for a night of shenanigans. Or so I thought. Upon entering his apartment, Johnny produced a box of condoms. He had tried this before, so I wasn't phased, and adamantly told him it wasn't happening. The events that unfolded following this seemingly unimportant interaction still haunt me today. Johnny's smile disappeared and his eyes went cold, hauntingly cold. I was sitting at his dining room table with my back against the wall. He was standing at the other end of the small table. You make me sick. I'm sick of you. You play me. All you do is play me. We were serial pranksters and sarcastic in every sense of the word. While his countenance made my skin crawl, I knew he was joking. I had known Johnny for years, after all. I've thought about this for a long time, and you're dead. I'm not doing this anymore. You make me so sick. I hate you, and you're dead. He was unnervingly calm, and his voice betrayed a slight hint of anger I've never heard before. I noticed him clenching his fists, popped out veins tracing up his arms. For the first time in our entire relationship, I felt unsafe with him. He held my gaze, unblinking. His second floor apartment was on campus. It was summer, I had seen nobody else in the building, no other cars in the parking lot, even if I could get past him, which I couldn't. My two options were unlocking the balcony door and jumping, or racing 15 feet down the hallway to the dead bolted front door which opened inwardly and getting down a flight of stairs. Either scenario led me to an empty parking lot. I would have to get to my car or run into the woods nearby. While athletic, I had no chance against him, physically. I focused on him. Half of me just knew he was kidding. He had to be. He would break into laughter any second now and we would return to our beautiful day. He continued talking. I can't repeat what he said. It was too graphic and specific to our location to write out in a public forum. He detailed the sexual assault he had in store for me. If I survived, I would be strangled in the nearby woods then carted off and dumped at a secluded spot we had explored together. He motioned to some bags he had on his counter. That's where your body will be within an hour. I'd had enough. His plan was too well thought out to be impromptu. I'm small, but I'm stubborn, and would fight to the death if I had to. I also have a wicked straight face when I need to. It was my turn to hold his gaze with all the ferocity I could muster. I stood up and said the first thing that came to mind. I'm still proud of the unflinching calm I presented. Inside, I was begging God not to let me die. You're real funny. I almost believed you for a second. Wouldn't have worked anyways, because what I was going to tell you before all that happened is my dad asked me to come home tonight. He needs help first thing in the morning with the garden for mom's birthday because Kyle, my brother, hurt his back and I told him I'd call him as soon as I was on the road within half an hour. 
It was a lie, and not a particularly good one, but the delivery was convincing. I dangled my phone in his face and told him he could explain to my dad why I wasn't coming home tonight if he wanted me to stay. Johnny's mouth was agape as he stared at me. I was just kidding, he mumbled, fists still clenched. See ya, I chirped, pushing past him. My gamble paid off. I grabbed my purse and shuffled down the hallway. I could feel his eyes burning through me and the electric energy in the room as I internally screamed at myself to move slowly. The deadbolt disengaged, I walked out and fought every urge to run down the stairs. I was too far from my car if he chased me to beat him and refused to give him the satisfaction of seeing me scared. I walked out the entire length of the car park. I've always had a habit of parking as far out as possible. Next to the woods, he told me he would murder me in. I knew he was watching me the entire time. I could feel his eyes follow my every movement. As I drove out past his apartment, I saw his shadow in the balcony window. I waved. He stared. I drove a few miles to the nearest Walmart. It was only eight and the sun was just starting to set. People milled through the parking lot, blissfully unaware of what I had just gone through. I collapsed into my steering wheel and broke down, bawling my eyes out. Then I drove the four hours back home. Stupidly, I didn't know how to process what happened and banished it to the recesses of my mind. I spent the next few years avoiding Johnny. The few times I thought about it, I blamed myself for being so naive. I finally told my mom four years after the fact and was able to process through it. So, possible murderer ex-boyfriend who thankfully now lives about 10,000 miles away from me, let's not meet again. If you haven't heard yet, we've upgraded our voicemail to a more simple system. If you'd like to leave us a message about the podcast or your own scary encounter, simply visit disturbedpodcast.com and click the blue microphone in the lower right. You can leave up to a two-minute message. We'll be playing some of those messages in future episodes. This episode is made possible by Supporty. Are you struggling to stay motivated to the goals you've set for yourself? Maybe you're trying to wake up earlier, but you keep hitting that snooze button. Or perhaps you have dreams of starting your own podcast or side hustle, but you haven't been putting in the work consistently. Well, one of the best ways to make lasting behavioral changes is by an accountability partner who will help you stick to positive daily actions. So, how do you find a reliable accountability partner who's going to engage with you and keep you honest? Supporty is a mobile app that matches you with accountability buddies for a week at a time. Supporty pairs you and a buddy up one-on-one. That's for maximum accountability. Plus, it's mutual. So, you encourage your buddy and they encourage you each day of your seven-day session. What's really cool is you can see whether your partner accomplished their daily actions and they can see the same about you. If you want a more effective way to stay motivated, experience the difference of an accountability partner. Download Supporty, that's support with an I at the end, from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store and make sure you choose Disturbed Podcast when you create your account to start your two-week free trial. You can check out the show notes of this episode for more details. Get encouragement, get motivated, and achieve more with Supporty. In our final experience, we're introduced to Reddit user William Baudelaire with narration by yours truly. In the forest, no one can hear you scream. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. I have never been so petrified in my life. To this day, I still do not know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he is still where I saw him. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting uni. Our home was, and still is, just outside of a small town with forests all around. There was also a small, man-made lake. 
which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk, but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forests there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path, which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream, and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles walk at which point the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I'd continue to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, then follow the river west to get to the lake. It's easy to get lost in this forest, because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water. It goes up and down, and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I'd spent many days wandering around there alone, or with my dad over the span of 18 years. Never saw anybody else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone-ish. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after about an hour or so. As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away, coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring, fervently and periodically, which I found strange. I listened well, wondered if it was a lost hunting dog, and started moving towards the sound. I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy, because of how clear the sound was, to be on a collar. I kept moving, and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after about five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell that could have been enclosed in a tin or something, and the river was too far still. I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound, apart from one obvious thing, which I didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person. I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally. Until I found a badger, a dead one, carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife. It was fairly fresh. The body was still limp, and there wasn't too much of a smell coming from it. The wound was full of maggots, but I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of the bell had been following the stream, so had I. So the badger was put there, maybe killed there, at least decapitated, while I was walking that way. I suppose, I don't know really. Nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. I left home around 6 p.m., I made it to the stream then walked to the river in an hour, then decided to go back the way I came because it was getting late and it was raining quite heavily. The sun set around 9 p.m. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while through the clearest and most open part of the forest. When I bumped into something heavy, the smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger with his head strung to his front paws. That area looked a bit like a ham because of the way it was tied, just swinging from the tree. It was this putrid bag of stench, wet and dripping green liquid. I started gagging. I had some sort of mucus textured fluid in my hair. It was repulsive. At first, I just stared at it slightly gobsmacked. Then I started fidgeting violently because I felt like I was drenched in its juices. I was soaking from the rain. My senses became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice cold water had been thrown over me when I realized that I walked the same way to get to the river so someone had strung up the body after I'd passed it on the way there. Someone knew I'd see it. So... Was someone watching me and running around the forest? Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me not animals? 
I looked around and started jogging. I was half running, half walking away from the stream, back towards the path for a while, when I heard the bell again. I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part of the path to me, to go as fast as he could and that someone was in the forest. I can't explain the feeling I had. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raise despite being soaked. It was dark. I was jogging as fast as I could. I was panicking because the path was still a bit far away, just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than before. The bell went on for way longer than the last time, on and off. I felt like it was surrounding me at this point. The fear combined with my compromised hearing and the fact that I couldn't flip and breathe properly was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a goddamn horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path, that I needed to run, that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing the half running, half speed walking thing again because I was out of breath. Then I heard branches break clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest, and the bell ringing louder. I didn't want to, but I looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me. A tall figure, creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing this bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me, Now, I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting ability or instinctual adrenaline-induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I didn't look back once. I screamed as much as I could. I lied. I'm on the phone with the police. They're on the path. Dad, I can see you. I'm here. I wanted to yell, Dad, please tell me where you are, but I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like the man was right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping and wheezing, crying so hard and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck and then switched it off. I just ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation of his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. My mom could hear it on the phone. She was waiting with the car ready to leave fast. We went directly to the police station and I got medical attention soon after. My dad burst into tears in the car, said he could hear the bell, and thought he wouldn't be able to see me, asked what if I didn't have my phone, and what if he hadn't picked up. They were almost as terrified as me because they witnessed everything through the call. They could hear me trying to run and they could hear the danger, they just couldn't see it. The police couldn't really do much. They searched the area and the only thing they found was a folded t-shirt placed under a rock. I didn't really question it at the time and my bag was not recovered. They said it was probably some homeless man living in the forest, but failed to realize what could have happened if my dad didn't know that part of the forest like I did and where to find me. I'm not blaming anyone. The entire thing was my fault. There are just so many what ifs. I want to believe it was just someone who decided to live in the woods and hunt or something. Maybe they were a bit mentally unstable and they felt angry that I came into their territory. But what if it was more insidious? The way he moved towards me was abnormal. It was perverse because of how slowly he was ringing the bell. It's like he had me trapped. I didn't see any more detail. I just ran. 
To this day, I can't go anywhere where I'll be alone, and the sound of bells is a real problem. The smell of moss as well. Anyway, my parents and Steve Jobs saved my life. So go hug yours now and take decapitated badgers and bells as pagan signs that you're unwelcome. If you've enjoyed this episode of Disturbed, consider supporting us as a premium listener. Find out more at disturbedpodcast.com slash fan club. Original score for this episode by Kevin Hartnell. Special thanks to all the contributing narrators and submitters of these stories. You'll find all the relevant links in the show notes. You can see more info and leave us a voicemail on our website, disturbedpodcast.com. To leave a voicemail, click the blue microphone in the lower right. Let us know what you think of the show. We want to hear from you. Make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening so you always get the newest episodes automatically. You can find us on all major podcast platforms by searching Disturbed. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod to stay up to date with all the latest Disturbed news. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Stay safe out there, y'all. And now, a sneak peek at episode three of Disturbing Calls. Somebody help me. <laughs> they're in the living room and they're not breathing. No. She's trying to commit suicide now. She's trying to choke herself. My wife just shot her kid. Please help me. <laughs> Please, dear God, I think I've killed him. God, help me. What did I do, Lord? What did I do? This episode of Disturbing Calls drops Monday, September 14th, exclusively for Patreon fan club members at the $5 level or higher. If you want exclusive access to these Disturbing Calls episodes, head over to disturbedpodcast.com slash fan club and become a Patreon supporter today.